<laughs> this is Mishmash, a weekly conversation where we try to unjumble an important and sometimes under the radar statewide story that affects you, and we are live. I am really, really excited about our next two guests because not only are they really experienced in legislating and the blocking and tackling of politics right now, um, but they're very involved and attuned to what's going on in races for the Michigan House right now. So joining us, first we have Chris Gregg, former state representative, served in the Michigan House from 2015 through 2020, was the, <laughs> the House Democratic leader, meaning she led the Democratic caucus in the House in her final term, the 2019-20 term. She is currently the co-leader of Michiganders for Civic Resilience and heavily involved with My List and Femmes for Dems, groups that work to elect Democratic women to office. And then also joining us is Jace Bolger, who served in the Michigan House from 2009 to 2014, and he was speaker in his final two terms. He's now president of the Tusker Strategies Firm, a consulting firm with, which offers research and advice to political and public policy organizations. He is a Republican and informally assisting uh, in providing guidance from his many years uh, in politics to the Republicans in the battle for control of the Michigan House. So Chris and Jace, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you both so much for being here and not to totally date the show, but we are about three weeks to the election. You have both been there before those you know, final weeks crawling away leading up to election. What is it like to be a candidate right now? What is going through your mind? How are you feeling? It is pins and needles at this point and a lot of pressure. Um, you're right in the thick of the absentee ballot chase. So you've got a team there looking with through the clerk's records to see who's taken out a ballot. You're either calling them, you're going to their doors, you're doing whatever you can to track and chase every one of those AV ballots. You're still, you know, you're going to as many doors as possible too. And, you know, you're... You're not sleeping much, that's for sure. You're nervous, you're anxious, you're exhausted, you're, um, you're suffering under a little of, uh, politics is not war, but call it fog of war, where you're getting pieces of information. Sometimes it's planted by the other side intentionally to mislead you. Other times it's uh, based in truth, but it's suffered the telephone game, and so it's wrong. And so you're deciding, trying to decipher what to react to, what to let go, and those who do best stay on their plan and keep marching forward. Absolutely. So, you know, talking a little bit about the plan, both of you have, you know, led your caucuses during, you know, this election season. You know, at this three weeks out, what is it like to be overseeing that operation? How do you make the decision of like, I need to keep spending here, I need to cut money here? You know, what, you know, are you making decisions right now or are you trying to stick with your plan? Well, I think to Jace's point earlier, too, is you have to stick to the plan, um, and it has to be very data-driven. So you're getting reports in in terms of polling. Um, you're, getting, you're seeing ad spends, all of that. And so that's driving a lot of your decisions if you, if you stay with the original plan or make a, some adjustments. There are always some adjustments on there. Um, but, yeah, it's constant data coming in and trying to adjust from that. I'd agree with that. You've got a plan, but then you do adjust based on the data, and you adjust based on the candidates. Is the candidate, can you tell, is the candidate clicking in their district? Is the candidate doing the work? Is the candidate stepping up, or is this somebody you're going to have to try to carry where there's a candidate that's hustling? Because hustle beats money when money doesn't hustle. So uh, I think you've got to make those decisions, and you can make that based on data anymore. Uh, or now you've got... Uh, uh, apps, you've got, it's not the paper walk list of my day. Oh God, that makes me sound <laughs> old. Uh, but you've got, walk, you've got apps that uh, will tell you, is the candidate actually working? And so you can hold people accountable and make decisions based on that. Yeah, and you, you keep deciding too, uh, do you continue with the negative ads? Do you just go more in the positive? Because again, you're looking at that data, how are their favorables compared to the candidate they're running against? And just, yeah, a lot going on at this point. What you can't do is you can't flit around. You can't you know, bump, yeah. well, we saw this, so we're gonna react because then you don't have message penetration. Right. Then you're, you're reacting and you've burned your time, your money, and your effort on something that doesn't sink through to the voter, so it doesn't do you any benefit. And you can't start, you know, to see a flat flash over here and get distracted by that because that flash could have been planted by the opponents or that flash might be something interesting but it's not enough 
And so you got to make sure that you're disciplined about those final decisions. Well, and I think another thing that people don't um, think about as much is it's not just election day t as well. You have to also, as, as the leader, be planning for what if there are disputes afterwards, what if there are recounts, anything like that. So you've got that whole uh, activity going on as well. There's just a lot of different avenues. And based on what happened in 2022, you may have a whole different strategy on um, what are you going to do if there's disputes about the in the certification process as well. So a lot of different balls in the air. And when you're the caucus leader, not only do you have all that going on, then you've got people who want to talk to you about policy. You've got people, whether they're <laughs> Or oh, lobbyists up. in town or those darn reporters want to ask you about a policy, a bill. Uh, you've got a governor who's not up. You've got a Senate that's not up, and they're all going about their work. And they're, um, I'll tell you a quick story. I was there at the end of a, a cycle, just exhausted, uh, crossed the cycle. Now it's time to do stuff, and came up, and it's the point is it's an odd-numbered year, and the Senate said, uh, you know, this is an election year, and so we're going to slow down. Like, where was that attitude last year when we were in an election? And last I knew, elections didn't happen in odd years. But the, the point is that, that different perspective, that different focus, uh, depending on what's going on. Well, up, listeners, you're hearing exactly why we wanted Jason, Chris on. There's a lot of expertise. They've been there. And, and a big part of the reason is, as much as the presidential race and the U.S. Senate are the big, shiny objects, when it comes to, you know, Michigan, and of course, this is mishmash under the radar, what's more under the radar than the race for control of the Michigan House? Because that is really what is the key toward what happens in the next term. The Democrats, of course, have total control right now. And the only opportunity for the Republicans to change that is this race for control of the Michigan House. The Democrats now having a slim 56-54 majority. So I'm wondering, um, you know, Jace, since it's your side that's trying to, to flip this right now, where do you think this battle stands? Well, the stakes are high. If uh, Chris might disagree with me, I think the state is headed in the right, wrong direction lately. That we've turned around from what was the right direction. And so, uh, what people talk about a governor's veto. But what they never mention is a Senate majority leader or a speaker effectively has a veto as well by deciding whether or not to put a bill up on the board. And so the stakes are very high if you care about policy. But then it's, it devolves or, or includes politics right now. And on that front, um, I think things are going very well for Republicans um, because I'm confident in their ground game. I'm confident in what they've been doing. They started much earlier than they had in the past. Candidates matter mechanics matter, message matters, and we can unpack any of those. But as I look at just one metric, we talked about the apps, so we talked about the ability to really measure doors. And I know that this cycle, the Republican candidates in key seats have done three times the doors that had been done last cycle. So that's one thing you don't measure with an ad impact, but it's something that absolutely matters in a House campaign. Yeah, definitely seen uh, doors picking up on the Republican side, and uh, I think that is making a big impact. I think they've done a good job recruiting candidates, too, this time around. Um, but I will say I am really happy with the direction the state has gone. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit in the last segment about uh, abortion and reproductive health care. That was incredible. Even though it was passed with a ballot initiative, we had to codify all of that in the legislature. And there's still work to be done. We need to get rid of the 24 for our waiting period. We need to make sure that reproductive health care is available to poor women as well. And so there's still work to be done. So when you say abortion really isn't a salient issue anymore, that's absolutely wrong. And I think um, the Democrats are doing a good job bringing that up as an issue because if every single Republican candidate up and down the ticket is being you know, um, talked about in terms of their stance on reproductive health, boy, that straight ticket option sure looks good. Yeah, Just throw them all out, you know, but but I will say, you know, it is incredibly close in the state house, and it could absolutely go either way. And we don't have Democrats don't have a lot of the things, you know, the wind on their back that we did in 22. Um, but the one thing that I think is helpful is, you know, because of the change in term limits, this is an incumbent election cycle. Right, We have very few that decided not to seek re-election. And that might be the difference for a Jim Hodsma, for a Nate Shannon. you know. And, and so those are going to be tough races. 
but I think incumbency can help with those as well. Yeah, I would have a different take on that same fact, and that is this cycle is a outsider, is a challenger election. And you see Kamala Harris, current vice president, and Donald Trump, the past president, both arguing they're the outsider in the race, which is fascinating to watch. But it tells you what's going on on the ground, so I'm not sure incumbency helps you this cycle. Well, since you brought up the very top of the ticket, Harris and Trump, I'm curious, we often as reporters are looking at what is the trickle down effect throughout the ballot and do either, what do you both feel is gonna happen with the top of the ticket? Is it gonna help or hurt Democrats or Republicans, Republicans for having Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, Democrats for having Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket? Uh, I'll look and say in, this is a much better cycle for Republicans than 2022 was. So if I look around the room, does anybody think the top of the tickets can be decided by 12-ish points? I don't see any hands up to those uh, listening. And so that alone makes it a much better environment. But if I look uh, just at results in the state House districts, there's only two Republicans who sit in House seats today that Donald Trump, or I'm sorry, that Joe Biden won in 2020. But they won in 2022 when Gretchen Whitmer ran away with her reelect. There are four Democrats who sit in seats that Donald Trump won in 2020, even when he lost the state. There are 11 seats, those four plus others, seven others, doing my math, uh, that uh, Donald Trump won in 2016. So if you think it's going to be somewhere between 2016 2020, it's a much better environment for Republicans this time. But I'll give you another stat, and that is in 2020, in Oakland County and Kent County alone, there were 200, the difference between voters who voted for Donald Trump and voted for the Republican sheriff in those two counties was 225,000 people. He lost the state by 154,000 votes. The point is there are people still willing in those counties, and that's the epitome of what you were talking about earlier. We called them country club Republicans in my day, maybe you know, now rhino. Uh, the point is a moderate Republican. They're willing to split their ticket when they go down ballot. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, you know, absolutely with Kamala Harris on the ballot, it's, it's much better with the enthusiasm and the turnout for them. So from that uh, perspective, it's definitely a positive. And she has energized different communities to get out there with our turnout because it is going to be incredibly important to get people uh, turning in their absentee ballots and, and going to the polls. Um, looking at the return rate already in Wayne County, it'll tell you that. I think that's had a big impact, the enthusiasm, as well as the ground game that we've been working on for four years to make sure that we are getting in into our um, you know, deep blue communities as well and talking to them every single day and talking about voting, talking about the issues that matter to them. So I think that helps quite a bit. And then where I do think incumbency really helps is people down at the, I believe, citizens and, and neighbors at that state house level want to know the candidate. They want to know who's representing them. And so if you have a Nate Shannon that's been there six years already, um, I think that relationship with their constituents really does help. But it is, there are definitely elements of change going on here. Um, so we'll see. I, I'm hoping that, that the help goes both ways. Um, but there are definitely pockets, Macomb County especially, where I think it, it could be a negative impact on Democrats. And, and there you look, it'll depend on the top of the ticket where they, I, mean, I think Chris rightly and smartly points out where Democrats need to drive up turnout, but there weren't state house seats, swing state house seats in that area until she mentioned Donald Trump driving up turnout in Macomb where there are mm -hmm. key swing house seats. So drive up the turnout all you want for Kamala Harris in Detroit and Ann Arbor and East Lansing. That's not going to affect the state house majority. But it's, it's young people though and women too. And there are definitely pockets for turnout that she has energized and and they're everywhere in every state house. And that could be the margin, sure. right? So yeah, oh. it's going to be close. <laughs> oh, there'll be, if we got 10 million people in this state, there'll be 10 <laughs> seats that are probably decided by under 2,000 votes. So yeah. you're talking about 20,000 people out of 10 million that are going to determine who has the House majority. You've mentioned Nate Shannon a couple of times. He, he represents the 58th House District in Macomb. His seat and then the 27th House District downriver with Representative Jamie Churches, who's running for her second term. These are two Democratic incumbents in House seats that are very critical to House control, two of the most competitive. Um, you know, What do you see going on there? What do the incumbents need to do to win? And as a challenger, what do you need to do to knock out you know, an incumbent, particularly one running for a fourth term, which is 
you know, not something that's really happened before. Right, exactly. For many years, at least. Well, you know, Jamie Church is down on the 27th. Um, she, a uh, former teacher, really gets out in the community, and I think she's just got to keep doing that. But she also has to remind her constituents what has been accomplished in her first two years. Um, and a reproductive health is a lot of that. The, um, the Clean Energy and Jobs Act as well, that was huge. Uh, a lot of blue collar workers down there, so we got prevailing wage and you know the right to work repeal, all of that. And I think it's it's driving that home that these policies were people centered policies. They improved people's lives, and we need to keep that going. And one way to do that is return me to Lansing. Same thing with Nate. He's also a former teacher, uh, and he's got to remind him all the different you know all the different policies that have come about. And he's got that um, comparison of when he was in the minority and in the majority. And I think you, you just have to keep reminding uh, people about what that means for their daily lives here in Michigan. Jace, you, you mentioned the, the Trump one districts, and these are the, you know, A and, you know, one A and one double A of those. Uh, Nate Shannon's district was a plus six Trump district in 2020. Jamie Church's was plus four in 2020. Is, is it just enough to have the wind at the back for their challengers? That's Ron Robinson against Nate Shannon and Riley Linting against Jamie Church's, or what, what do they need to do to, to harness that? The short answer to your question is no, and I'll expand, but I want the audience uh, who's listening at home to note, I've got a piece of paper in front of me with those numbers. Zach just rattled those off the top of his head. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, my, my sheet dis- agrees with disease, you. It's a disease, Jay. It's a disease. <laughs> my sheet agrees with you. Um, and I would add in 2022, Gretchen Whitmer won those seats by 10 and 11 points. Yeah. And so that's the how much we're talking about a difference in cycle or that environment. But no, that wind is not enough. You have to put the sail up to catch the wind or you have to build the boat to get out in the water. You have to do the work. And so I would, if you just said, give me the people that are knocking doors the most, that are connecting with their voters, that are doing the work that they need to do to win, Linting and Robinson would have been at the top of my list. Uh, They've got a couple of other friends on that list, but they are right there at the top of the list. So I think they're doing everything they need to do to win and they've got a, they're going to have a better environment than they than that district faced in 22. In that downriver district, um, we've had you know in 2020 it was a Trump district, and Darren Camilleri proved you know doing the work, and he's working very closely with with Jamie to make sure you know that they're covering all the ground too. Nate was it, won in 2020 as well, so it is it, it's all these things coming together. It's definitely a challenge when you've got uh, you know, the Trump uh, additional factor there, but you know they've got the ingredients to make a win. But it's gonna be tight, it's gonna be absolutely you know, tight. The, the Democrats don't have as many opportunities to go on the offense, but one of them yeah. is certainly the seat that stretches from like Jackson to Chelsea. Uh, Kathy Schmaltz is the incumbent Republican there, first term, and she's up against the Jackson mayor, Daniel Mahoney, so the Democrats got a, you know, a very high profile candidate. Uh, to run, and it's kind of a 50-50 seat. It was deliberately drawn. It's sort of like two Democratic cities with a whole lot of uh, rural Republican territory in between. What what do each of you see happening there? Jace, it's really Kathy Schmaltz's first real test. The Democratic campaign kind of fell apart there two years ago. It is. Uh, she was on the air uh, for quite a while before she ran for office, though, so she's known in that district. That is a district that narrowly went for Trump both times, so a uh, decent district for this cycle for her. Um, I think she, and I know she's doing the work, she's making the connection, and they're hitting Mahoney on some similar issues to the past candidate. He's a different candidate, but they're hitting him on some similar issues. So I think there's an opportunity, I think, uh, Smaltz ultimately wins. This will be tight, but the point is there's an opportunity to knock the Democrat off their message. Uh, and I think that Kathy Schmaltz wins because she does the work, because she connects with that district. I, I think it's a really interesting district that both candidates have very high name ID as well, too. So again, it is going to be going down to, to getting to being disciplined, following your plan, but also getting out there and working as hard as you can on those doors. So it is. It's 50-50. Um, I think I think Mayor Mahoney <laughs> will will actually prevail. So we had a couple audience questions. I think you know this one is pretty topical. What's the big race we're not hearing about? And I think the I would argue the Michigan House is a <laughs> big race that people don't talk about enough. We should always talk about the House. Um, you know, we talked about you know some of the three most competitive. What other races you know are you guys following right now? 
I think um, the 83rd is kind of interesting with Tommy Brand running again. Um, you know, and uh, can and you give us the cities of the 83rd? Pardon me. Where is the 83rd? It's it's in the Grand Rapids area. Yeah, and so uh, John Fitz, uh, Fitzgerald mm -hmm. is his finishing up his first term, and so you know I've got that dynamic too. Tommy was uh, we served together all six years, uh, and that'll be an interesting race to watch. I think you know there's there's some opportunity potentially there. I think there's opportunity there. I think there's opportunity up in the UP. The last Democrat held seat, and I'll go back to back in my day, north of the Knuckles, north of Clare, was all Democrat territory. We've had a shift uh, in Michigan, not just in uh, the you know, working class versus the suburban voters, but we've also had a shift in geography largely because of that dynamic. So I think the UP, keep an eye on uh, that district that was redrawn due to the redistricting court order, 13 in the um, in Macomb. I think that's a, a sleeper to watch. That's one nobody's talking about, so checking that box. Um, I think that's one that is of um, a su surprise uh, interest, uh, but the point is um, there, most of the field has been set all along. Again, those 10-ish seats, Republicans got to hold the, the two that they lost, and plus the Jackson seat. And then they've got to win two of the uh, seats that Trump has won. Yeah, and you can never count out Oakland County either. So we've seen Shadia Martini that's running there as well. She ran in 22, made some inroads in that district. It's highly educated area, Oakland County. Um, and, you know, she's, she's working really hard. So that could also be a race that we want to take a look at. I'm really excited, though, about Jen Hill and Betsy Kofia, um, our two most northern Democrats. Uh, I think they're going to pull those out without a problem. You know, this is kind of a presidential question left over from the last round, but it's interesting. Um, you know, do you think that the Trump effect of nothing sticks to him? So I think this is trying to say that he can say kind of whatever he wants and people don't really get super upset with him, at least you know, people are going to vote for him. Do you think that applies to future candidates, or do you think this is unique to Donald Trump? No, it's unique to Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't think they. I don't think it transfers at all. There's Trump rules, and there's everybody else's rules. I mean, he breaks every rule across every. I mean, everything you would say don't do, uh, he's done, and it almost seems to grow power from it, grow stronger by breaking those rules by flipping that over. And that's what his voters want. They want the proverbial uh, cart flipped over in D.C. They wanted it done in '16, and you're hearing a lot of clamoring for it to be done again now. So, uh, I think people are tired of it, frankly. <laughs> well, I, I'm Go curious watch about this because there is one Donald Trump and at some point there's not going to be a Donald Trump a candidate. He's not going to be running for stuff. So does the Republican Party find someone to fill that void or does it go back to, you know, the way things used to be if they don't have Donald. Because like right now, I think a lot of people would argue that there are Trump Republicans and then there are you know people who are not Trump Republicans. But he has taken over a majority of the party. So what happens when he's not there anymore? What I mean the, the Trump rules don't transfer is you can't be Trump light. You're not going to be Trump the second. Um, if you talk to his supporters, they'll give you some version of what they like most is his authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, voters want authenticity. So you can't pretend to be Donald Trump. You can't do the things that he has done and think you're going to therefore inherit his voters. Uh, I don't think that that works. So I think it will be somebody different. Now, where on the spectrum will that be? That's to be determined. But I don't think it's going to be somebody just like him. I think we should get every voter a free ticket in to see The Apprentice. I saw that movie last week. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Find out where some of that ethos comes from uh, with Trump. But I, frankly, I just, you know, I think more and more people, and we talked a little bit about it in the last segment, are just, they've had enough. You know, some of the work I do now with civil discourse, I, you know, travel across the state, people are tired of the acrimony. And I think, yeah, it was kind of, you know, interesting watching this guy, but it's time to move on. And I think more and more people are feeling that. And so I just, I think people are just ready to be done with him. Uh, enough people are ready to be done with him and move on to a new chapter, both the Republicans, uh, well, particularly the Republicans. We miss them. We miss the old Republican Party. <laughs> I must say, the two of you have been like so cordial together. It's, I think it's probably been nice for everybody to see Republicans and Democrats, you know, swapping ideas. It is. Shane, are you saying you're surprised I'm a nice guy? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't serve together at the same time. Maybe that was Maybe it. That's I don't know. We would have gotten <laughs> along no, like, just fine. <laughs> we would have gotten along fine. 
So we still have a few more minutes. I think we can kind of pivot back to the house. You both um, mentioned the 103rd Traverse City Area District with Representative Betsy Kofia and the 109th in Marquette, um, where Rep. Jen Hill is running for a second term. Um, you know, for both of you, I'm curious, what are both sides seeing there? You know, I think I think the environment there is going to be challenging for the Republicans to unseat those incumbents. Um, I kind of have a I'll believe it when I see it perspective in those seats. Um, Jace, what can you say to prove me wrong on that? And Chris, what do you think You know, the Democrats are thinking right now? Yeah, I would say I was telling, it was Eric Nesbitt at the time at the House Campaign Committee in my final term and saying, don't go after that Battle Creek seat. That's fool's gold. That was Kate Siegel when we were in office and we're not going to win that seat. And then it's been a very good seat since then. It trends. So, so things change. So I'd look at 109 and think of that uh, type of a scenario when when I see that. I think also we, we skimmed over messaging and we talked about in the earlier segment a little bit here, abortion, talked about democracy. Uh, clearly, if people are making their decision based on abortion or democracy. Democrats think they're going to win. I think Republicans want to talk to people about affordability, about the cost of groceries, about the cost of their car, their rent, their house, their utilities. And then we talk about security, safety. Uh, immigration plays a part in that. So that's where I think you're seeing the competing of ideas or competing of messages. Um, but it was kind of mentioned earlier, you've got to get your base to vote. And I think that's much of the earlier messaging. But those swing voters are going to make that decision, I think, more based on those kitchen table issues. So when I go up to a district, think about a district like that, both sides are going to motivate their base. But what's most salient to those people who are going to work every day uh, trying to feed their family? And I think it's those messages are in favor of Republicans this cycle. Well, I think, too, when you talk about um, reproductive health care, you're talking about more, more than just abortion. You're talking about freedom. And I think that plays into the culture in the UP as well. So it's not just talking about that, but it's talking about government interfering with your life. In the UP, if there's one thing that they don't like, it's that, right? And so I think Jen is, is just a great champion for that, but also the environment as well. And she's been a champion with that and fought back. And, you know, they're surrounded by beautiful, the beautiful Great Lakes. And I think that plays into it as well. Um, you, you do, you know, and there, there are things that have been done done with, you know, the cost of pre prescription drugs and things like that, that we can talk about for the everyday life. But there are so many issues up there. But at the end of the day, they want a champion like Jen there. And she has been working so hard and knows her constituents and works, you know, tirelessly. Same with Betsy in Traverse City. Traverse City, that area, area is a little different. We've had a lot of migration from southeast Michigan up there. Uh, and I think that is changing and is solidifying a democratic hold in that area as well. And Betsy is, uh, she's a monster. I mean, she won in a extremely close, close race in 22, but she's been working every day when she's home, and then uh, the money she's raised has been incredible. Let me add, the, when I talk about issues, the votes that they've been cast, I don't think line up for re-election. They've walked a lot of planks. Uh, if you'd look at, uh, in some ways, I need to respect what they've done. They've, without a vote to spare, they have gone about dismantling all what we did over four years in basically one year, and just rammed through, but you look at just pick one issue, the energy bill, and you look at the blowback Jen Hill took in her district over that local units of government, furious over what she did. And so the point is they're going to pay a cost, I think. Will it be enough? We'll see soon. But I think they're going to pay a cost for a lot of the votes that they had to cast. They came back to town to do the SEIU dues skim. That thing's offensive when you understand it, but it can also be messaged very quickly about, very easily, about driving up the cost of health care. I think, you know, to your point, messaging really is important because, you know, I see it in a different light, but it's, it is, it's that message discipline and what resonates with the voters. I'm wondering if you could kind of tell the audience and the listeners, the, the unique thing about these Michigan house races is you can do so much with shoe leather and going door to door. You know, you look at U.S. Senate, President, even Congress, these are TV and mail wars. And there is a lot of TV in these Michigan house races, but when you're campaigning in a seat of 90,000 people, you know, any good candidate is out there hitting the doors with those, I guess it's an app now, not a, a paper list. Um, can you, each of you sort of describe, you know, how that's important, but then, you know, where the, the, there is a lot of TV, how that is also a different, if it is a difference maker. Feel Whoever wants to jump well, in first. That's, you know, it's interesting. I've been really trying to, leading up to this, trying to pay attention to what's on broadcast anyway. Um, 
and it's it's all Democratic ads right now at the state house level, which is really interesting. And then last night I was in Grand Rapids and I saw the same thing. Now it's very different at the presidential and the Senate race. So, you know, it's how many people are there reaching because it's one big media market in Southeast Michigan. So, in, you know, hopefully that won't that'll be a good decision and it won't be like confusion for people when they see a whole bunch of candidates on these commercials. But um, I think it's almost a point where you have to do it. It's not, it, you know, we'll see. But I think it's digital is what's really taken over because you can target that so much uh, better and really get down. It's just so granular. And that's what I think has made m more, uh, more of an impact on these races as well. But again, you know, thinking back in 2020, when I was the leader, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I thought, you know, we ran a great campaign. We had great candidates. We raised more money than we had before. But at the end of the day, it was a wash, <laughs> you know? And it is. It, it gets frustrating because you do feel like there's a lot of things just completely out of your control. Um, but you can't give up. You got to keep going at it and, you know, and hopefully it goes your way. Yeah, I think TV depends. Uh, for $12 million, you might be able to buy the station up in Marquette. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't shopped for Radio's it. Radio's big, too, up there. Yeah. But if you go to the Detroit DMA, as Chris was just talking about, there are, what, 50-some yeah, house least. seats yeah. in yeah. that um, metropolitan area? Of what? So if you're buying TV, you're buying for to advertise in 50 house seats. If you're buying $12 million, which I think is about the number, and splitting it among four people, now you're spending about $3 million, huge dollars in a state house campaign. But you're up against the presidential in the U.S. Senate last time, last time I looked were at over $256 million in that uh, DMA alone. And so by my math, you've got one candidate, state house candidate commercial for 99 political, for every 99 political commercials for somebody else. And so is that spending scary? Absolutely. Are Democrats going to spend way more than Republicans for the state house this time? You bet. Uh, they may double them up in total spending. But to your point, Zach, I think there are a lot of people who make a decision on a state house level because they know somebody, they like somebody, they met somebody, uh, far more than they can quote uh, their position on any single issue. I do wonder what the impact will be, though, on straight party ticket voting. Mm -hmm. I really do. Because if you're only hearing that one message, um, we'll see. I'm, I'm just kind of curious how that's going to play out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, Jace. Thank you. We'll give a round of applause. Thank, thank you. So you. Much. That's it for us this week. This was our first live show. So a huge, yes, yes. <laughs> A huge, huge, huge thank you for Hearns Laguerre Jr. This show is never possible without him. Huge claps for Hearns. Also, Tristan McFoley, who has also come all the way from Detroit to be with us today. And we also can't forget our news director, Jerome Vaughn of WDET. He keeps the trains running on time and is 100% a mensch. And as we say often in the credits, mixing, mastering, and music by Sam Bobian. And please consider subscribing or getting a free trial to go on our new service, or of course you can download our free elections app. Thank you all, thank you to our guests. Um, thank you to Urban Beat. And thank you to Urban Beat, yes, I, was, I forgot. Yes, thank you Urban Beat. Yes, a beautiful venue. Use your code Mishmash. <laughs>